Hello and welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Stephen Griffith's self-titled Crossbow Cannibal. Griffiths had quite a chequered history. At 17, he was arrested and charged after an unprovoked knife, knife attack on a supermarket manager. And in 1991, he was actually diagnosed as a schizoid psychopath. In 2009, he was admitted to the University of Bradford to write a PhD on homicide studies. By mid-2009, ladies in the area where he lived started to disappear. To find out more about this case, visit www.murderuk.com or how about having a discussion down below in the comments about your thoughts on this case. Stay tuned now for a video documentary about Stephen Griffiths. Thank you. Mutilation. Dismemberment. Cannibalism. Some of history's most twisted killers have seemingly been driven by a desire to desecrate their victims. She had beautiful legs. And I wanted to keep those long legs. He cut off her head. He put it on the mantle above the fireplace and just yelled and screamed at it. Forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger has spent decades delving into the minds of serial killers. They have to go beyond the killing to get gratified sexually, which in this case is mutilation and dismemberment. Serving detective Jackie Sabir is an expert in the mechanics of murder. This is a place that is so remote. If you're going to bury a body, this is the place to do it. Between them, they're analyzing a series of crimes so gruesome. I've never seen a case where the dismemberment has been so extensive. They are impossible to forget. To find out that the old child has been hacked into 84 pieces is something that you'll never ever forget. And investigating if its perpetrator was born to join this most diabolical of clubs. He was looking at me and then he just started giggling. And he says, you're dying. British detective Jackie Sabir has worked on some of the UK's most disturbing homicide cases. She's travelled through rural Yorkshire to a historic city that was once the setting for a series of horrific crimes. Bradford is a city at the foothills of the Pennines and it's primarily known for its industrial heritage. It was a wool producing city but these great, wonderful factories have now fallen into disuse and disrepair. It's an area that's fairly deprived economically. Bradford has all the problems of a lot of rundown cities in terms of crime, problems with drugs and prostitution. Perched on the River Eyre, the nearby commuter village of Shipley largely escapes Bradford's issues. But in 2010, it played host to a devastating find. Former detective Colin Prime headed up a team that was called to the scene. What brought you here to this particular location? Well, the, the police received a call mm. uh, from a member of the public. And if you look back here across the weir, as he looked out, he saw a bag. At first glance, the shape of the bag's contents didn't raise any concerns. They thought at first it might have been something like a football. And when they had a closer look, it clearly wasn't. When you arrived, what did you actually see here then? You could quite clearly see what looked to be a head. And if it wasn't already bizarre enough, the features were missing. One of the difficulties of this case was that you couldn't do any visual kind of identification. It was a very distorted appearance that we were dealing with. Not only had the murderer mutilated the head, 
but the method of kill suggested the work of a most twisted hunter. Did the skull show any signs of injury? The skull did have an injury, yes. It had a crossbow bolt going through the skull. So, sorry, a crossbow bolt was still in the skull? It was still embedded in the skull, yes. But as the search of the river air continued, nothing could prepare police for the scene that unfolded. During that search, we recovered uh, in excess of 80 body parts. 80? 80 body parts. I've never seen a case where the dismemberment has been so um, extensive as in this case. Forensic psychologist Professor Lou Schlesinger has spent his career unravelling the minds of the most depraved serial killers. For him, the discovery of mutilated body parts is a sign of a most disturbed perpetrator. Now, in some cases, dismemberment is a method used to dispose of the body. But when you're not just dismembering, but you're mutilating, it's because that act itself is stimulating sexually. You assure yourself that the victim is absolutely without life and totally under your dominance. During the late 60s in Cape Cod, Tony Costa's murder and mutilation of four young women was unearthed in a local wood. I come across a plastic bag. It was dismembered, pieces. You know. I mean, the horror. I mean, God, crazy. From the mid-90s in Baton Rouge, American serial killer Sean Vincent Gillis's macabre fascination with his victims' bodies drove him to dismember and mutilate after their death. She had beautiful legs. It was one thing that I recalled about her. And I wanted to keep those long legs. legs huh? He's just getting gratified by dismembering, mutilating. The longer it can go on, the more gratifying it is for him. Ed Kemper dismembered his victims, but saved special treatment for his mother, who he killed and then beheaded. He put it on the mantle above the fireplace and just yelled and screamed at it. And at times he threw darts at her face. He cut out her vocal cords because it was her chastising him using those vocal cords that, uh, that so bothered him. In May 2010, in Bradford, Yorkshire, over 80 dismembered and mutilated body parts had been recovered from the River Air. Two days after the gruesome discovery, a female victim was named. From dental records, we were able to establish that the remains we'd found were the remains of Suzanne Blaymeyer's. It was a tragic end for the 36-year-old who had grown up on the outskirts of the city. Suzanne was such a beautiful girl. She was absolutely stunning. She loved dogs, cats, horses. She enjoyed most thing, normal things kids do. As she got older, she was quite ambitious, you know. She wanted to have a good job. She finally decided she wanted to be a nurse. She went to college in Bradford. But following the collapse of her marriage, Suzanne's adult life took a downward turn and she lost her place in college. She admitted she was on drugs. Her whole life were out of control. She just couldn't seem to get a grip. As her life fell apart, Suzanne turned to prostitution to fund her addiction. When she first told me she wanted to work in the red light area, I was absolutely devastated like any mother would be. 
I just wanted us to stop, but she wouldn't because she had to have the drugs. Suzanne was last seen working the streets four days before her dismembered body was discovered. You know, it's bad enough somebody's murdered your daughter, but to find out that your child has been hacked into 81 pieces is something that you'll never ever forget, obviously. And the disturbed killer who had carried out this diabolical act was about to be unveiled. Forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger and serving detective Jackie Sabir are unraveling a sordid murder case from 2010. In Bradford in the north of England, the dismembered and mutilated body of Suzanne Blamiers had been recovered from a local river. Suzanne had been working as a prostitute. Four days earlier, she was known to have returned to a local man's flat on the edge of Bradford's red light district. What happened next was captured on camera. One newspaper had had a call to tell them uh, of the evidence of CCTV footage which had been witnessed by a caretaker. When he scanned the CCTV, he saw this, what must have been a horrific sight. The block of flats was home to 40-year-old Stephen Griffiths. On the night in question, he and Suzanne had been seen approaching his third-floor bedsit. Detective Jackie Sabir is on the scene, unfolding the series of events that followed. The CCTV recovered from the corridor shows Suzanne and Stephen going into his flat. Very, very soon afterwards, she comes running out. Suzanne's mother, Nikki, has seen the video firsthand. He's either done something or it's what she's seen and straight away she's run for the door. Straight away I think she's twigged that, you know, the summer is dangerous. She, after a short time, is seen running out of the flat with him in pursuit. He was armed, he was armed with a crossbow. He'd had to stop her getting out the main entrance, but in a panic she'd forgot which end the lift were at. Nothing could prepare anyone for the brutal actions that followed. There's a struggle between them. He drags her along the floor and shoots the crossbow bolt through her head and then drags her back into that flat. It was just like a horror movie. It was just like a horror movie. A short time later, he then comes out, walks the length of that corridor, right up to the camera lens. He holds up one finger as an almost victory salute, uh, celebrating what he's done. He wanted the police and whoever was going to be viewing that CCTV to know it was him that did it. Stephen Griffiths was born in 1969. He and his two younger siblings spent much of their early childhood in the West Yorkshire countryside, just 10 miles from Bradford. Local journalist Paul Stokes knows the village of Flockton well. This is where Stephen Griffiths spent his early years, his yes, early childhood. The family uh, came here when he was about five years old and they sort of went, had his primary education here. He was quite a quiet, uh, quiet boy, but other than that, he seemed to, to, to be a, a pretty normal childhood. Age 13, the academic Stephen Griffiths won a place at a top school in Wakefield. The standard of education that he would have been afforded at that young age would be second to none. 
As a fellow pupil, Brian Butterworth often joined Griffiths on the school run. Most of the bus journey, Stephen would have um, sat quietly at the back, not really integrating with people. Stephen didn't really stand out. Yeah, he didn't really seem to be passionate about anything. He was the kind of kid who just got on with it and um, filled his time at school with being at school. Although Stephen Griffiths continued to progress academically, his home life fell apart. Following his parents' split, the teenager developed a deep-rooted resentment towards his mother. He would tell stories about his mum as if he absolutely hated her. She seemed to want to uh, relive her youth and had become uh, a bit of a, a party animal herself. An increasingly solitary Stephen Griffiths started to display worrying behaviour. The main thing that we picked up from neighbours, uh, which, which stood out, was that he, he was a bit of a nocturnal being. He possessed an air rifle, which he would use to, to, to shoot birds. I mean, that's not unusual, though, is it? Particularly for a, a young lad that's been in the countryside shooting birds. That in itself isn't, mm. but it's what happened afterwards. All right. Having shot the birds, he actually then dismembered them in a rather brutal way. It was uh, ripping apart, uh, almost as though the kill wasn't enough. Forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger has studied the childhoods of history's most macabre killers. Like Stephen Griffiths, many harmed animals from an early age. If young boys are going around killing animals and dissecting them, you have a major problem and this individual needs to get help. Many serial sexual murderers started out by killing living things. They were fascinated by animals in agony. These twisted childhood actions were displayed by the prolific mutilating murderer, Jeffrey Dahmer. Pulled a fish out of the lake, just a little sunfish and took out a pocket knife and slashed it to bits. And my other friend said, what the hell did you do that for? And um, Dahmer responded, I just wanted to see what it looked like. A child's not going to go out and try to kill an adult right away, but you've got to warm up to these sorts of things. You've got to gain some degree in comfort in killing. As a teenager, Dahmer's fascination with death would widen out to include humans. He had seen in the newspaper an account of a young man who was killed on a motorcycle. And uh, he actually went to the funeral home to uh, view the, the corpse. But he became so aroused that he excused himself into the bathroom where he masturbated. It's increasing from initially exploring animals and then taking a look at a body of somebody who's been mangled up in an accident. It's abnormal by any standard. It's disturbed. In Bradford, England, former animal abuser Stephen Griffiths had developed a passion for reptiles in his adult years. But despite his interest in lizards, former neighbour Rachel Farrington Naylor recalls an incident that suggested the 34-year-old still possessed a sadistic streak. So one day I went to Stephen's flat and I was asking him about his lizards and what they eat and everything else. And he went, oh, it's just feeding time, I'll show you now, and got a, a rat out and this rat was sort of like cowering and it just bit it and it bit it in half, completely in half and I really felt sick. Um, and Stephen just laughed and said, oh, that's nature for you. In 2010, Stephen Griffith's prey had escalated to humans. His vicious crossbow murder of sex worker Suzanne Blamiers had been captured on a security camera outside his flat. The investigation into Stephen Griffiths is very unusual because there was no manhunt. So there wasn't that fear that police often have of trying to find him. With undeniable evidence, authorities swooped on Griffith's address. Mm -hmm. 
the police uh, mounted a, a major armed operation. They thought there was a possibility of a shootout. Former neighbor, Rachel Farrington Naylor, was passing at the time. We were actually driving past, so we were coming from this direction down. Yeah. And we just saw outside the front door, there was just loads of police, police with guns. When they banged on the door, it's believed the killer said, I'm Osama bin Laden. The shootout never materialized, and he came without a struggle. The 40-year-old killer's calm demeanor continued as he was brought in for questioning. Former police surgeon Leslie Lord was one of the first to meet him. Initial impressions were somebody that was bright, cooperative. He didn't seem bothered. He was just so calm. He came over quite arrogant uh, and totally remorseless. During the interview, Griffiths freely admitted to Suzanne Blamier's murder. He also offered graphic detail of the barbaric treatment of her body. He had quite a lot of injuries on the backs of his hands. And I asked him, just, how did he get those? And he said, he looked at me, almost sneered, <laughs> chopping and dicing. Griffiths had cut Suzanne's body into more than 80 pieces in his Bradford flat. It's actually quite a leap to actually cut somebody up to the extent that the perpetrator did in this case. I have never seen a case where the dismemberment has uh, been so um, extensive as in this case. Detective Jackie Sabir has analysed CCTV footage around Bradford at the time of Suzanne's murder. It reveals how Griffiths brazenly disposed of her remains. Once he'd killed Suzanne, he's used public transport to take body parts. I mean, that's a huge risk. I actually met Stephen outside of the buildings where we lived and I noticed a smell and I said, what's that smell? And Stephen had told me it was the dead body of the lizard in his rucksack. And he said, I'm just gonna take this and bury it away somewhere. He's got Suzanne's head with the crossbow still in it, in a rucksack. And he's deposited the body parts in the river air here. As Griffith's sinister confession continued, yet more extraordinary revelations came about. He wants to be in the limelight. He's got an arrogance about him. He starts to say he's killed multiple victims. And the river air was about to reveal more horrors from the hands of mutilating murderer Stephen Griffiths. In May 2010, in Bradford, England, Stephen Griffiths had admitted to murdering and mutilating sex worker Suzanne Blamiers. As police continued to recover the victim's body parts from a local river, Griffith's confession in custody continued. Whilst myself and the team were down at the, the River Air, we were being fed information in relation to what Griffiths was saying. Stephen Griffiths admitted he had killed before and the search team's latest gruesome find supported his suggestion. As we were going through the recovery process from the river, there were some other uh, remains found, which belonged to the, another woman. In addition to the remains that we found of Susan Blamires, we also found remains of Shelley Armitage. Missing for a month, 31-year-old prostitute Shelley Armitage had been in Bradford city centre on the night of her disappearance. Shelley Armitage had uh, a meal with a friend in a cafe on City Road around about seven o'clock. Shelley then headed to the city's red light district. Detective Jackie Sabir is at the scene of her last sighting. What's significant is this CCTV camera above me 
is the last known recording of Shelley Armitage's movements. Where Stephen Griffiths lived at the time is literally a three minute walk from here. Although Griffiths hadn't been captured on camera with Shelley, he is known to have met up with many of the prostitutes in the area. But it's thought that often sex wasn't on the agenda. Griffiths would invite some of the girls from the red light district that is so close to his home address back to his home. They could use his shower, get something to eat. So he certainly did have a relationship with them. There was no concern for them coming back to his home address because others had done it before. Throughout his adult life, Stephen Griffiths had often made a good first impression. Ex-partner Kathy was swept off her feet by the former grammar school boy. I fancied him, he had long hair. <laughs> um, and I actually, I liked his intelligence. And the, the fact that I, I thought he was a really smart person. When I met Stephen, he was doing his degree in psychology. Despite being impressed by his intellect, Kathy was unaware that her new partner's student days had been marred years previously by an incident in a college library. He thought he was being mocked by four girls at the college. He actually produced the knife and threatened them. When the, one of the girls' fathers confronted him about it, he produced the knife again and threatened him. For this episode, he underwent psychiatric assessment. He was given the label uh, psychopathic, schizoid, obsessive. And Griffiths was no stranger to violence. Age 17, he had attacked a security guard with a knife in a supermarket. Slashed the face of the security guard in a, in a very vicious way, leaving him needing 19 stitches. In later years, Stephen Griffiths would also display his darker side through psychological control. Been friends for eight years, and nobody has been there for you more in the last couple of years than me. You know that, even your mum and dad. After an initial honeymoon period, former girlfriend Kathy became a prisoner in her own home. I was kept away from my friends and my family. If I went to the shops or I had an appointment. I wasn't allowed anywhere unless I was with him. As she became increasingly isolated, Kathy's relatives asked the local police to check in on her. Opening the door, he's got hold of my left hand. I looked at the policeman and they just said, look, your family are concerned. We're coming to check that you're OK. Are you OK? Has he squeezed my hand? I remember my eyes saying no, but my mouth saying, yeah, oh, I'm fine. Griffith's dysfunctional childhood behaviour towards animals also resurfaced. He chopped the tail and the ears off a puppy. He's also put cats in the canal, in a bag and a stone. And his physical abuse was soon directed at his partner. He'd be really quite quiet and passive to start with, then all of a sudden he would flip and he'd hit you with something. He's stabbed me in the leg. He split my lip. Punched me in the face, broke my nose. On one occasion in Griffith's flat, his actions were so extreme, Kathy feared for her life. He was looking at me, and then he just started giggling, laughing, and I was like, what's so funny? And he couldn't stop laughing, and he says, you're dying. And I went, pardon? And what he'd done is put a drug in my tea, and I can remember kind of swaying, and I looked at him and I said, you're not joking, are you? And he went, no. Despite being hospitalised, Cathy survived the incident, and eventually broke free from Stephen Griffiths. That's all I want. Why it is you think I did all that shit? At least I'm 
find a decent set of text or email me what it is I am supposed to have done. Whilst Cathy tried to remain out of his reach and rebuild her life, Griffiths became increasingly isolated. He did stay in his flat a lot. He used to be in all the time and he didn't have many visitors. It was very rare he did speak to anybody. He was a quite a withdrawn person in himself. He'd knock on his door, you'd know he'd be in, um, and he wouldn't answer and he'd just stay completely quiet. Behind closed doors, it's thought that Stephen Griffiths took drugs as his solitary life took hold. Professor Lou Schlesinger has witnessed this phase of isolation in the lives of many of history's most disturbed killers. Many of these uh, serial sexual murderers are very, very isolated from others. And at the same time, many people can't put their finger on it as to what's wrong with this person, but they keep a distance. And the individual then retreats further and further into his own isolation and into his own dark fantasies. During the 1970s, loner Richard Trenton Chase cut up animals in his flat. As he moved on to human prey, he mutilated his victims before drinking their blood, earning him the title the Vampire of Sacramento. To those who knew him at work, London-based Dennis Nilsson seemed to be a sociable addition to the office. Dennis Nielsen was an individual who interacted at least adequately with people that he worked with, but when he left the job and went home, he was totally isolated. He really had very, very little in the way of relationships with other people. Those who had been close to Nielsen had been driven away by his self-centered, controlling personality. I can't understand you. I ask you to start filming from the feet slowly up to the head, and you go sit, but sit, pan. Bloody hell, don't you, don't you ever watch movies? They're training. Chimpanzees are kicking out of the camp. Anybody can do it. An isolated Nilsson would end the lives of at least 15 young men. Before he dismembered his victims, he regularly sat their corpses in his living room, holding conversations with them. He even would go so far as to come home from work and find the corpse sitting in the same armchair that he'd left him in that morning and saying to him, oh, guess what happened to me today? Nielsen was rejected by most people, yet at the same time he wanted to be with other people. And so he collected people and considered the dead people that he collected basically his friends. In 2010, Bradford resident Stephen Griffiths had admitted to the murder and mutilation of two sex workers. As police delved into his life, it became clear that the years leading up to his brutal crimes had been a period of solitude, during which it's thought he had become captivated by the subject of death. When I went into Stephen's flat, it was a bit like um, walking through a maze. There were just piles and piles of books everywhere. They were all books about killers. The lifelong academic had also centred his studies around the macabre. He chose uh, as his thesis for a PhD at Bradford University, and his choice was homicide in Victorian Bradford. But behind closed doors, the reclusive Stephen Griffith's interests weren't just historical. They found two crossbows, which uh, we know Griffiths had called the Jaguar and the Skeleton. He used to have a few types of different weapons. One would be a knife, but he also used to carry ammonia in a squeezy um, washing up bottle because he would squirt that at people. Alongside his growing fascination with weaponry, he still harboured another obsession, his former partner, Cathy. Stephen Griffiths pursued Cathy for eight years. I was bombarded then with messages, phone calls. I was absolutely bombarded with them for attention. If you're going to blame me for doing things to you, then I might as well start doing things to you. All right. 
He went round to the house, he painted all the windows, filled them in, bright yellow, painted slag up the wall. You've got so many enemies there, and you want to add me to them. Then there'll be another message saying, I still miss you, Cathy. You're still my world. I really miss you as well, Cathy. You've had the police on me, but I still care about you. And it really hurts that you think that I've done all, all this stuff. But out of dozens of abusive messages for Cathy, one is still hard to forget. The answer machine clicked on, and then all there is is him laughing down the phone. But I don't mean laughing, he's cackling. <laughs> that chilled me. That really did freak me out. <laughs> and it's the same night that one of the girls was murdered. In May 2010, Stephen Griffiths was in custody. Having admitted to the murder of a second prostitute, Shelley Armitage, traces of her body had been found in the River Air. And then, the discovery of a mobile phone would reveal the full horror of Shelley's death. Griffiths left his mobile phone on a train. On that mobile phone was disturbing footage that he had filmed of his desecration of Shelley's body. I was shown um, video footage of the victim lying in a bath. It was obvious that she was dead in that bath and he appeared to be talking to her at the same time. The harrowing video filmed in Griffith's flat would reveal more disturbing detail. He had some wording scribed on the back which says something like, I'm a sex slave. During his running commentary, Griffiths added, I am the bloodbath artist. Here's a model who is assisting me. In my opinion, I think Griffiths wanted that phone to be found the shock value of, of the viewer when they saw that footage, for me, all plays into his mastery, his control, his sensationalism of showing, look what I've done. But Stephen Griffith's headline-grabbing antics were far from over. The nation would soon learn that dismemberment and mutilation were not the only shocking aspects of his murderous actions. In May 2010, in Bradford, England, Stephen Griffiths had confessed to murdering and mutilating sex workers Suzanne Blamiers and Shelley Armitage. But as his interview unfolded, he insisted his crimes stretched back further, stating another prostitute had been his first victim. Eleven months previously, 43-year-old Susan Rushworth had gone missing from the Red Light District. And tragically, it seemed she had ended up in Griffith's flat. Police did find blood staining, which could be uh, matched to Susan Rushworth, which showed that the flats had been the final place for, for all three victims. Despite his confession, Griffiths would not reveal the whereabouts of Susan's remains. Very frustrating. Um, really, really difficult when you start to think about the family, um, because they must be living in torment, not knowing where Susan is. Many were mystified as to why Griffiths would admit to more crimes. But Detective Jackie Sabir believes the criminology student viewed three murders as an important landmark. 
the minimum requirement to fit the FBI's classification of a serial killer. It all fed into this fantasy that he was a serial killer. It all framed his terms of reference that this is who I want to be. I want the notoriety. Look at me. Look what I've done. Just four days after his arrest, the stage was set for Stephen Griffiths as he faced murder charges in court. It turned out to be one of the most dramatic days uh, in, in a British magistrate's court. He was asked to identify himself. He used the words, crossbow cannibal. There were gasps in the court over the crossbow cannibal. Griffith's claim that he had consumed parts of his victims left experts divided. In terms of cannibalistic activity on the human remains, there's no evidence that there, was, that there were any uh, teeth marks. But I would say that the internal organs were missing. But once again, Griffith's flat provided a clue. Traces of a victim's remains had been discovered in his kitchen. He felt physically sick when they were saying they'd got DNA off the cooker. Even now it gives me shivers thinking about that. For Professor Lou Schlesinger, Stephen Griffith's cannibalistic claims may have been born of a desire to enter the history books. He studied sexual murderers. He was totally obsessed with it. And he wanted to be a famous serial killer with a name. We named himself the Crossbow Cannibal to set him apart from other notorious serial sexual murderers. Amongst this most unusual class of killer, cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer's insatiable desire to consume human flesh has made him one of history's most infamous perpetrators. And I would cook it, mm -hmm. just as an escalation, trying something new. It made it feel like they were more part of me. What was motivating this was sexual gratification. Now, an average person looks at this, they say, how could that be sexually stimulating? And the answer is, it's not if you're normal. Self-professed cannibal Stephen Griffiths was found guilty for the killing of Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage, and Suzanne Blamiers in December 2010. Like those killers before him who have dismembered and mutilated, Stephen Griffiths has left an unforgettable legacy. I just can't comprehend how a human being can do that. Just a monster, basically. For him, it was, it's all been a game. But it's not for other people. All of it has been for shocking the world. For Jackie Sabir, Griffith's gruesome MO, committed after his victim's death, gives a crucial insight. We know he killed Suzanne with a crossbow. That was very quick and effective. But actually, the time would have been taken in the dismemberment is so significant, I think. It was all about power, control. Even in death, I have got control over this. This despicable inner desire connects Stephen Griffiths to a most diabolical class of killer, whose ultimate destiny was to mutilate and desecrate. Jeffrey Dahmer, Sean Gillis, Edmund Kemper, Stephen Griffiths are basically doing it for the same reason. Killing is not sufficient, so they have to go beyond the killing to get gratified sexually, which in this case is mutilation and dismemberment. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.